Welcome everyone, this is Agent Ice with another level design deep dive video. By the end of this video, you're going to have a much better understanding of all three acts of the most underrated zone in Sonic 1, Starlight Zone. Let's begin. Picture this. You just crawled your way out of the watery ruins of Labyrinth Zone. You were overwhelmed with fear and frustration as you avoided deadly traps and struggled not to drown as you dove deeper and deeper into the flooded ruins. You barely made it out, drenched with water, coughing as you gasped for air, and with a newfound appreciation with solid, dry land. Take a moment to gather yourself. Robotnik got away, and now you have no idea where he went. Your soaked shoes and socks make a squishing sound as you walk. It is dark now, but you see lights in the distance. Like a moth, you're drawn to them as you slowly make your way toward them. You eventually reach a highway covered with street lights and see nearby buildings with various lit rooms. But what is even more amazing is the sky. It's filled with bright stars. Fortunately, it isn't cold tonight, so your soaked body isn't freezing. In fact, it's a bit warm. A welcome departure from the cold waters of the ruins you just escaped. Your feelings of fear and frustration are melting away, and you're starting to relax a bit. You realize you are starting to feel fatigued. You want to just lay down under one of the bridges and stare at the starry sky and admire the beautiful scenery before you. Soon you're lost in thought and your mind wanders. Then you snap out of it and remember, you're on a mission. And it's time to get back to work tracking down Dr. Robotnik. Starlight Zone is the fifth zone in the first Sonic the Hedgehog game. It's also the second to last zone in the game. That's right, you're almost finished with the game, and it's one of the shortest zones in here, so enjoy it while you can. And what better way to enjoy it than with a level design deep dive video? <coughs> So let's do what we always do, and see where Starlight Zone shows up. Once again we see it in Sonic Drift as a track named Starlight. It's even referenced in Team Sonic Racing on a billboard, Starlight Scent. It also shows up in the Adventure of Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon, the Sonic X Archie comics, and the Sonic comics by Fleetway. And Sonic Colors, sort of. Here's some additional cool facts about Starlight Zone. This is the last zone you can get a bonus ring, so make sure that if you didn't get your emeralds yet, you get to the end with at least 50 rings so you can take a try. However, if you need more than two, you're kind of out of luck for that good ending. Also, this zone was originally intended to be the fourth zone in the game. That's right, you would have been playing this instead of Labyrinth Zone, which would have originally been the second act in the game. Have you ever played Starlight Zone and were immediately confused by the sound of a goalpost spinning even though you were nowhere near one? Well, that's because they used the sound effect of the goalpost for the background music for this zone. So don't worry, you weren't going crazy. Well, probably. Hopefully. One final little juicy tidbit is the layout for Act 1 of Starlight Zone was actually implemented in level 7-1 in the game land area of Sonic Colors. Doesn't look the same, but it's the same layout. Now let's take a look at the level itself. You're on some kind of elevated green road that's made out of metal that has a white top to it. It's got lights embedded into the metal parts of the road and several street lamps and occasionally even some bushes it seems. In the background, you'll notice a dark sky with plenty of purple and white stars. It looks pretty nice, really. But if you drop down, the background will begin to change. Instead of seeing a starry night sky, you'll start to see buildings that are lit up in the background. And they're pretty far back there, really. Drop down even further, and you're going to be met with a different sight. Stone and brick buildings with metal fire escapes are right next to you. This is really cool because we get to see up close and personal the architecture that's likely used in the rest of the city in the background. However, there's something very off about this entire city. There's no people. It just seems like there's a bunch of badniks and you know Dr. Robotnik's hanging around somewhere. So who lives in or uses all of these buildings? The world may never know. 
Now let's look at the difficulty and feel of Starlight Zone. This zone is both fast and slow, easy and hard. Although we've already experienced the ability to take several different paths in other zones, Starlight Zone really kicks it up a notch. BAM! It really is the tale of two cities. Especially with the two layers of the city in the background we pointed out earlier. Like usual, the route you take will determine how fast you get to that goalpost as well as how much of a slog that journey is going to be. They create complexity by offering several paths to get you through each act. They create difficulty by relying on momentum-based mechanics for some of these paths, placing badniks tactically that you generally cannot destroy, one of which they usually put several of in the same area that explode and shoot projectiles all over the place. And of course, you need to be careful platforming to avoid falling from your death and fireball launches that are waiting for a chance to nail you. And let's not even talk about the crumbling and falling floors. Now, in spite of all of these dangers, I'd just rate this place a 5 out of 10 for medium difficulty. I think experienced Sonic players or platforming veterans in general will not have too much trouble, but I've personally seen many newcomers struggle here, and for good reason. That being said, it's a really cool zone, and you can tell that they put a lot of effort into designing it. Now let's take a look at the environmental hazards that we're going to run into in Starlight Zone. Starting with the fan. This thing blows in more way than one. Not only does it help circulate the air, but it also blows you back and prevents you from moving forward at times. Heck, sometimes it'll even blow you into enemies, and that really blows. Especially if you're in a hurry to get through the stage, or you're trying to keep your ring so you can try the bonus stage at the end. Crumbling and falling platforms. Step on these and they fall apart or drop out from underneath you. It can make you fall down to another area of the level or to your death. Perhaps a testament to the shoddy construction of robot slave labor. Big half spike ball chain. It's a big spiky ball that's kind of cut in half that swings back and forth on a chain. You can jump on top of it and ride it like a platform that moves. Pretty cool, but watch out for it. Teeter-totter spike balls. So the teeter-totters use spike balls as a counterweight to propel you into the air. But if that ball touches you, it's going to hurt. So be careful and also try not to fall off because you might fall to your doom. Speaking of falling to your doom, yes, you can fall to your death in this level, just like any other level. Getting squished. You almost have to be trying to pull that one off, but it is possible to get squished in a couple of places fairly easily if you're not careful. Now let's look at the enemies. Since this is the second to last zone in the game, you might be expecting a lot of new enemies. Well, there's fewer enemy types in this zone than any other. In fact, there's only two types of enemies you're going to run into. You have the bomb. These guys have a short fuse, and if you get too close, they'll light it, causing them to explode and shoot four projectiles from their location. No, you can't bop these guys, so don't even try to fight them. Just try to avoid them and their projectiles. Orbanaut Uni Uni! Unlike the Orbanauts from Labyrinth Zone, these guys don't throw their spike balls at you. They keep them like a shield and just sort of spin toward you slowly. Try to jump over them or go underneath them. Alright, now let's take a look at Starlight Zone Act 1. Even at just a glance you can tell there's a lot going on here. There are several routes you can take to get through the level with many overlapping paths. Honestly, it was hard to figure out how to mark up the map due to this, however, I think I have a system that works. We have three main routes that we can use to get through the act. Route A starts off with some rings and a jump that leads us to a new badnik type, the bomb. These guys live up to their name. Take that yellow spring behind him and get past another bomb. You don't want to stick around too long because these guys will blow up and maybe hit you with their projectiles. Also, this is your first enemy that you actually can't really defeat. In fact, even if you have invulnerability, you can't defeat these guys, which kinda sucks. 
You're gonna step onto a platform with yellow lights, and these act like a staircase. It'll automatically go down. Kinda neat, isn't it? Here we get to build up some momentum as we go down a bumpy hill. Go fast enough and you can continue on Route A, which goes up a steep incline. Hit that red spring and go flying along the ceiling and past a bump and near a fan. This is the first fan you'll run into if you take this route. Some fans run continuously, and others will shut off for a second or two after they run for a while. Either way, unless it stops, you aren't getting past it. Funny enough, they use this idea again in Sonic 2 Oil Ocean Zone. Next, you're going to see a new type of Orbanaut. This guy doesn't throw his spiky balls at you, he just rotates them around as he moves closer, kind of using them as a shield. Get past the bad neck and you hit another impassable fan. It forces you to take an opening staircase down, which leads to another one. This leads to several more of these staircases that are guarded by fireball launchers. Yeah, they're definitely turning up the difficulty a bit here. As long as you take it a bit carefully though, you can avoid getting hit, luckily. You can continue along and find a floating platform with green lights below it. You jump down on the platform and it takes you up. But be careful, if you take too long to get onto that platform, the floor might crumble underneath you, causing you to fall down, which will put you on Route C. Once you ride the platform up, and you get enough momentum to go up a few slopes, make your way up to Yellow and Red Spring. Take the red spring up and bang your head against the platform above. This reverses the staircase to come down. Take the yellow spring and hang right, and you'll get two ring boxes. And then jump on it again and take it up to the left to go up the staircase. Just watch out for the Orbanaut above. The rest is pretty simple. Take the path down another slopey hill, and go up another steep incline, and hit another red spring. You'll fly past a fan, and maybe two ring boxes. If you can slow down though, you might want to grab them. And then get blown by another fan to the goalpost. If you were careful and you held onto your rings, you could take a shot at the bonus stage by jumping through the big gold ring. But hold up! There's a couple of secrets we kind of passed. At the very beginning, you can spin to break the wall and reveal a hidden area with invulnerability power up and three ring boxes. Grab your loot and spring back up. What's more, once you go down the staircase near the Orbanaut, if you walk away from the staircase enough for it to go off screen, it'll reset and you can grab the 1-up or the anniversary token depending on the version of the game you're playing. Now let's take a look at Route B. If you're like me, you tend to like being high. At least as far as the map is concerned. Anyway. You start out on Route A, but after going up a steep incline, build up your speed and fly up after taking the dip. Do it right, and you can land on top of a platform with a yellow spring. Start moving to the right as you jump and hit that yellow spring and keep holding right. You will land on another platform on the far right. You'll just be able to make it if you do it right, otherwise you're going to fall down and land back on Route A. Let's say you didn't make the dip and you're still on Route A. All hope is not lost. Wait for the Orbanaut to move on and jump up and hit the staircase above you to open it. Then you can go up the staircase and end up on the same platform with the Yellow Spring. Pretty nifty. After taking the leap of faith, go under the Orbanaut and pass the dip. Watch out for the fireball launcher at the top of the dip. Here you have two options. You can continue along by jumping on the rotating platforms to the right. If you mess up though, you have five bombs waiting for you down below. Don't mess up. You can also jump down and hold down the jump button and nail that ring box below and bounce back up. Just make sure you hug the wall. Make it across the platforming challenge and go up another ramp. There is an annoying fan that will try to push you to the left. Just wait till it stops or keep moving to the right until it stops blowing you off. No pun intended, of course. Go past an Orbanaut and through a loop-de-loop -loop and take the stairs platform down. This puts you back on Route A for the remainder of the level. Fortunately, by this point, you're almost to that goalpost. Alright, now let's take a look at Route C. This is the lowest path you can take in this act. And unlike before, we aren't taking that steep incline up. Nope, we're dropping down. 
This puts us through a fast-moving section with a loop. However, be careful, because after that loop you'll go up a hill and across collapsing platforms. What's more, you might just run off the edge into a pit, so slow down and get past the Orbanaut, and get past the rotating platforms. Then, through a dip, and more rotating platforms. They really like these things. Watch your step, because if you miss, you might fall down. There are a few collapsing platforms waiting for you after the first two sets of them, and then you go down another two sets of rotating platforms, which will require you to drop down. You're gonna have to either be patient and ride them down, or you can be impatient like me and just walk off the edge and hope for the best. Now you're gonna continue along to the bottom and hop up a platform that'll take you up to another moving platform that will take you to an area with more rotating platforms to get past. Make your way up toward the top and continue across the gap, and you will see a goalpost. Yes, this act, much like Springyard Zone Act 2, actually has two goalposts, one right under the other. But wait, that wasn't enough paths for you? We can skim over some alternate routes really quickly. First off, let's talk about Sub Route BA. Once you get to the Troll Ring Box, you can view the rotating platforms and just drop back down onto Route A if you decide you want to take it. There's also Sub Route AA. You can take Path A, but passing the Fireball Launcher spam area, jump up and hit the stairway platform to make it come down. Then you can just take the stairs up, keep working your way up, hitting another stairway by the vulnerability power up, and now you're back to Route A. But wait, there's more. For sub route CA1, take route C and get past the four rotating platforms and jump up to hit the stairway platforms that are above you right after this section. Work your way up and around and before you know it, you're back on route A. However, if you tough it out through pretty much all of route C and you don't want that bottom goalpost for some reason, you can always hit the staircase and go back up to Route A and hit that cool post. Why you would bother doing this, I have no clue, but you do you. And if you thought that was a lot of routes, you ain't seen nothing yet, folks. We've got two more acts to cover. Now let's take a look at Act 2. Act 2 starts off with you standing next to a red spring. You can take the hint, or don't, but you need to make it up the ramp. At the top, there'll be an Orbanaut waiting for you. If you just ran up, you'll just need to jump over it to avoid damage. But if you took the spring, you can simply hold right and fly past it, and then barrel down the slope. Rowdy will go through a couple of loop-de-loops, and up another ramp. Land on the floor and walk forward until you fall down to a platform below. Here you need to exercise caution. There are five bombs waiting for you. It'll be hard to get past them until some explode. You can be impatient like me and take damage to abuse and vulnerability frames, or just wait for some to explode and jump over the rest. This will lead you to another ramp and a fan. The fan won't allow you to get past it, so you must take the rotating platforms above to get by. Be careful, because you can get crushed here. Land on the platform above and run by a fan that'll give you a bit of a boost. Boosta! Get up enough inertia to get through the two loops and up another ramp. Be careful, because you have another Orbanaut waiting for you. Jump over or roll under it and hit the staircase platform that'll take you down below. And watch out for another Orbanaut. Now, you get to meet the teeter-totters. If you touch the spiky ball, it'll hurt you, and maybe send you flying downward. Now listen up, because there's a trick to this. Hit the far end of the side opposite of the ball to launch it into the air, so it flies up and over to the other side. The more times you do this in succession, the higher it'll go. There you stand on the teeter-totter partially determines how far you'll fly up when it lands on the other side. If you stand on the far end, you'll get as much boost as you can, however, you can actually stand right in the middle and get the same boost as you would being on the far edge. 
That's pretty convenient, considering it's a lot easier to stand in the middle. Anyway, spring yourself up to another teeter-totter and do the same thing with it. This will allow you to reach a platform above with more bombs. You can easily avoid them and move quickly and jump onto another rotating platform to get across the gap. Grab yourself five ring boxes for your efforts and then drop down over the ledge you just jumped over. This will make you land on a platform below that will gracefully take you down to a slope. Go down the slope and grab that goal post. Now let's cover Route B. After the two loops in the beginning, all right after going up the ramp. This will allow you to go onto a platform above. Go over a curvy road and take the elevators down. Just watch out for that red trap spring up top and the Orbanauts waiting below. This will put you back on Route A. It's short, but it works. It just isn't necessarily the fastest route. Route C is the lowest route in this map. After loop, slow down and fall through the crumbling platform. Or just fly up the ramp and hold left to fly over the fan and land by them. After you drop down, a fan will boost you forward toward a steep slope that leads to a loop. Now we're getting some speed. The loop will shoot you straight down until you hit a half pipe where you can fly up and grab some rings. Hit the yellow spring below and continue along past the Orbanaut. Go through another loop and down another hill and through yet another loop. Yes, this place has more loops than Green Hill Zone. Go up and land on the platform you just shot past. Here you have this blocky staircase that slides around. Use it to get across the gap and then use the teeter-totters to go up and over to the right. Spring up past the fan and run forward up a couple of ramps and hard right to the goalpost. Now let's discuss Route D. While on Route C, you'll go through a loop and fly down a steep drop. Use this momentum and hold right and land on a platform. Be careful because there are four bombs waiting for you here. Also, don't get too close to that fan or it'll blow you off the platform. Take the rotating platforms up immediately to avoid the bombs hitting you and make your way to the right. Get past an Orbanaut and go up an incline. You'll need to make sure you have some speed build up unless you're playing a version that has spin dash. Play over some crumbling platforms and hit a yellow spring and hold right for dear life. Keep holding right because you have three bombs above you. The fan will help you get away though. This also helps you land back on Route A. Alright, now let's talk about the fifth and final route we have to cover, Route E. About halfway through Route C, you're going to need to go through a loop-de-loop -loop and then be shot into the air. Hold right and go up the platforms up to another one that takes you to a teeter-totter. From there, use the teeter-totter to spring yourself up, hit a yellow spring, and go right onto the platform above. Jump onto a floating platform that'll take you up to another floating platform that'll take you to another floating platform where there's a small hill. Run down the hill and you're right there at the goalpost. Now that we've covered the main routes, there are several sub-routes you could take, but we're only going to take a look at sub-route CD. For CD's nuts! Ha <laughs> ha! Got him. On Route C, after the second loop and steep drop, you're going to jump toward the top of a curved hill that takes you down to another loop, and that should get you onto a platform with a steep curve. If you have enough inertia, you can go up it, and then you'll run to a fan that'll push you to the right, which will allow you to go up to the next floor. Here you're going to have an invulnerability power-up, as well as a ring box, and even a 1-up or anniversary token, depending on which version of the game you're playing. Take the red spring up and to the right, get past the three bombs, and move toward two teeter-totters. Take one to get up to the next one, and then use that one to get up to a platform. There's going to be two bombs up here, and the first one's probably going to activate as soon as you get up there. You might want to drop back down onto the teeter-totter and then let that bomb explode before you come back up. Move to the right and go through the rotating platforms, and if you ride them to the top and jump off to the upper right, you're going to have five ring boxes waiting for you. They'll be pretty handy if you want to try that bonus stage later. Then, drop off the side and land on a platform that'll take you down to a slope. Run down the slope and you're at the goalpost. If you needed one more emerald, this was your last chance to get it, so hopefully you got to the end with 50 rings. And finally, Act 3 of Starlight Zone. Let's take a look.
This deep dive video might make the zone sound like it takes a while to get through any of these acts, but in reality, it doesn't take very long at all. They're very short, and you'll see that when you play them. Act 3 is going to take a little bit longer due to some of the complexity, and of course there's a boss fight at the end, but this is still going to go relatively quickly. You start out really far up in the air with a straight road that has an Orbanaut in front of you. Jump over the Orbanaut and soon you're going to be falling down a steep hill that has a jagged edge in it for some reason, and fall all the way down into a dip. From here you have two ways to proceed with Route A. You can either land and get past the Orbanaut, up the ramps in front of you, eventually hitting a red spring and going up a little ramp and go through the two deer totters, or you can build up your speed and hit that dip and use it to fly up into the air and land on one of the teeter totters, which is going to be a little bit faster. Either way, you make your way past two teeter totters, but be careful, the second one can send you flying up toward bombs that are above you. And even if you don't hit them directly, you're going to trigger them so they explode. However, you can avoid this happening to you by standing just off-center on the teeter-totter that'll bounce you up into the air without going up too far. Then hurry up and grab that invulnerability because you're going to need it in a few seconds. Make it past all three teeter-totters and you'll land up above. From there, you're going to go up a ramp and then down a hill and through a loop. This is reminiscent of Act 1 because we have another steep slope that goes up and a red spring that'll send you flying the rest of the way up along the ceiling. Hit the spring and go through three loops. Yes, they really liked using loops in this zone, but can you blame them? Blow past the seven bombs on the ceiling above you and get onto the platform on the right so it'll move you up. You might want to wait for the bombs to explode just to make sure you don't get hit by those projectiles. Once they're gone, get some speed and run up to the left up a ramp. Here you can get a shield on the left, and if you really want a few rings, you can jump on top of a swinging half spike ball on a chain and grab them. Otherwise, just make your way to the right, watching out for that swinging spike ball, and jump onto another platform that's going to bring you up to the next area. Run down a slope and through a loop-de-loop. -loop. After the loop, you're going to hit a dip and fly up, but you're going to hit the ceiling probably. Anyway, there's a teeter-totter here, and you know what to do by this point, but this time you want to get the maximum jump you can off of this teeter-totter. So it's going to take you a few times of launching it into the air. But again, you can make things a little bit easier for yourself if you step onto the center part when you go and wait for the ball to land. Make your way to the very top, and you're going to have a slopey hill that goes down and leads to another loop-de-loop. -loop. From there, you're going to go flying down, past a fan that's going to blow you to the right even more, and you're going to hit a checkpoint where you make your way to the boss. Now, there is a Route B to this map, although it's very short-lived and probably not even really worth taking. So remember when we got past those three teeter-totters at the very beginning? Well, you go up a ramp, go by the fan, get you some speed up and jump, and you'll make it to a platform that's kind of hanging out there. This will make you go past three Orbanauts, which, yeah, have fun with that. And then you'll go up a ramp to a fan that'll blow you to Route A. Now maybe Route A and B aren't your thing. Well, you can always take Route C, which goes through the middle of the map. While on Route A, instead of taking that steep path up and then hitting the red spring to go toward the top of the map, we're going to actually drop down, go over a little bit of a hill, and then down a very steep slope. At the bottom, there's a dip, and you can use it to go flying into the air, and maybe even land on the sliding staircase platform up above. But, let's say you want to get that invulnerability power-up that you blew past. Well, just land on the ground, grab it, and hit a red spring, and use that to get up to the sliding staircase platform up above. Then you can easily get past the four bombs waiting for you. Otherwise, well, you just have to jump between them, which isn't too hard. Go over a crumbling section of the road, and then up a ramp where there's a fan that's going to blow you to the right. You're going to see two Orbanauts, but honestly, you should be able to just spin underneath these guys and avoid them. However, there's a third one at the bottom, so be careful. Now, from here, you actually have two options that you can take. You can either go past the Orbanaut and up, watching out for that fireball thrower and the other two facing each other right after it. Or, if you still have your invulnerability, you should be able to easily run through the Orbanaut and spin to go through the wall. 
Down below you get to see three ring boxes and even more invulnerability. Grab those goodies and head right. No matter which way you go, you're going to end up on Route D, which we're going to cover next. Now, let's say that you're fond of the lower paths because you like a challenge and bottomless pits. Well then, Route D is the path for you. This one's going to diverge from Route A fairly quickly. We can skip all that teeter-totter nonsense up above and instead stand on crumbling platforms that are right in front of the Orbanaut. Once you fall down, you'll be on Route D. There's a fan blowing you to the right and there's four bombs waiting for you. You can either trigger the bombs and slowly make your way across, or just have a couple well-placed jumps to get across with no problem. There's going to be four troll yellow springs here, I don't know why they did that, I guess they were bored. And then there's a teeter-totter. So here's the thing, you can do a couple things with this teeter-totter. But first, you're going to probably get bounced up once and see a bomb light up. I would suggest waiting until it explodes before trying to go up any higher. That being said, if you get the maximum boost from the teeter-totter, you can actually hang left, and there's going to be a ring box, an invulnerability power-up, and a 1-up or anniversary token depending on the version of the game you're playing. From here, you can either go and run and jump and hopefully land on the platform that you could have bounced up to on the right, or you can just drop down and hit that teeter-totter again and then use it to go flying up. Be careful because there will still be one more bomb there. Now I've got two spinning platform areas to get past. This shouldn't be too hard, but watch your step, it's a long way down. Once you make it across, you're going to be at stairway platforms again. Once you step on them, they're gonna go down. But be careful, because there's two fireball launchers guarding this spot. Make your way all the way down, going past the falling platforms, and past the fan. You'll probably want to jump, because if you don't, you're gonna end up landing on those bombs below. And if you take too long, that fan facing the opposite direction, well, it's going to push you back toward the bombs. So you're going to need to be a little bit quick and careful here. Go past some more falling platforms and up a ramp where you're going to find a fan pushing you to the right. Just jump onto the platform in the middle there, and then wait for the sliding staircase to give you an opportunity to get on top of it. If you want to collect some rings, there's a few at the top, otherwise just make your way over to the right and continue along Route D going down a ramp. This is going to lead to a dip and another ramp going up where there's a fan blowing to the right yet again. I don't know why it's here, but it's there. Anyway, there's going to be another half swinging spike ball on a chain. If you jump on top of it and you ride it to the left, you're going to find a platform where there's three ring boxes and a shield power-up. This might be worth grabbing. Then of course make your way to the right, going past more falling platforms and up another ramp. There's an Orbanaut guarding a ring box, but you should be able to jump over him and grab it. Get past him and head to the left and there's another Orbanaut with a teeter-totter. Do your jumps well and you'll be able to land on that teeter-totter without losing your shield. Send that spike ball up, and as soon as you get an opportunity, land on the platform up above and haul right. Otherwise, you're going to get hit by the four bombs hanging off the ceiling. Head right past five bombs hanging off of the ceiling, and avoid that red trap spring, because it'll send you back toward them, and you're probably going to get hit by the explosion. There's also a stair platform here, so jump up, bang your head on it, and it'll open up. Just watch out for that fireball thrower. Go to the left, up another ramp, and you're going to see several bombs and another Orbanaut. This is the same way you would end up if you took Route C. Anyway, what you're going to do here is actually wait for the Orbanaut to move and let a couple of those bombs explode. Probably jump over the Orbanaut and head right up the ramp, hit the checkpoint, and bang, you're at the boss. To offer a humble mention to what I labeled Route E, which probably shouldn't even be called a route to be entirely honest. While you're following Route C, you go past some bombs and there's going to be platforms that crumble that lead to a ramp and a fan that blows you toward two Orbanauts. Well, if you drop down and you do it right, you can land on a teeter-totter below without hurting yourself and trigger a couple of bombs. Use this to bounce up onto the left and then wait. Then, whenever the bombs are gone, jump onto the teeter-totter on the left and use it to get onto the one on the right. And then use that one to get onto the platform on the right. You'll have access to a ring box and an invulnerability power-up. 
which then you'll use to go up the ramp, deal with the Orbanov up top, and then you can just destroy the wall there and get yourself three more rings and another invulnerability power up. It's a kind of a weird path to take, but you know, that's the thing about these games. They usually reward you for exploration, and that's definitely a reward as far as I'm concerned. Now for the moment you've been waiting for, the grand finale, the boss for Starlight Zone. This fight's either going to be extremely fun or extremely frustrating for you, depending on how familiar you are with the mechanics. I promise it really isn't that bad, so stick with me here. You approach the boss fight and you see three teeter-totters. Robotnik will fly in and drop a spiky ball on each teeter-totter and you have two ways to deal with this. You can either jump on the other side of the teeter-totter and make the ball fly over and use it to bounce yourself up into the air so you can hit Robotnik, or you can just straight up nail him with his own spike balls if you're quick enough. Usually it's easier to do this on the left and right instead of the middle one. Just be careful because if you're not fast enough, those balls will explode and launch projectiles. Give him a good wax by either bouncing yourself up into him or by hitting him with the spike balls, open up that capsule, and you're good to go. You've just finished Starlight Zone and you're well onto your way to Scrap Brain Zone, the final zone in the game. But that's a video for another day. I know this was quite a long video and I tried to keep it as short as I could while covering everything this beautiful zone has to offer. The various routes that allow for different degrees of difficulty, the aesthetic of the level, enemy placement and the environmental hazards here make this zone really unique and I would again argue this is one of the best zones in this game as far as how it was constructed. They really went all out on this. I really do that hope someday in the future Starlight Zone will make a comeback in another Sonic game but at the same time they're probably not going to hold my breath. But that's it for Starlight Zone folks. I want to take the time to thank all of you awesome people that let me use your Starlight Zone remixes in my video. The links to their channels are down below, and also it'll show up in the credits here shortly. Please stop by and show them some love, and tell them Asian I sent you. And I also want to thank all of you for watching this video. Some of you I know have been here since the very beginning when we started with Green Hill Zone. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed creating it. See you all next time for the conclusion of this series where we cover Scrap Brain Zone. And if you like this video, make sure you give me a thumbs up. And if you want to see more, make sure to subscribe. And feel free to leave your thoughts and comments down below. You can also check me out on Twitch. I stream Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I post my schedule on my YouTube channel. Anyway, that's all for now. See you next time.